This is Bonjour Chai, the Israel is so basic edition. I'm Avi Fongold in Montreal, and I'm here with Phoebe Maltz-Bovey in Toronto. We are your frozen chosen. On today's show, we dive into the looming judicial crisis in Israel and whether there is something to be learned from Canada. We talk to law professor and lawyer Brian Schwartz, who thinks that there is. And Phoebe and I discuss wither Jewish culture. Is there such a thing, or is there only culture about Jews? Phoebe, how's your week been? Well, it's been all right. You know, we've all had colds, but that, you know, it's, it's, it's Canada. COVID. It's chilly. It's not. Well, probably not. You know, um, I've had it too recently for it to be COVID, I think. So, yeah. You know, how about you? Um, it's been an okay. My kids are home all day. But today it's a professional day. So I sent them out of the house to go sledding uh, while uh, I record today. Um, yeah. That's so quaint and Canadian. What, professional days or sledding? <laughs> Uh, the sledding part. Okay. Oh, I think there are probably professional days here. Um, yeah, that sounds very, um, like there could be a painting. Sure. Yes. Uh, sledding on a PA day. Mm-hmm. Absolute P, PD day. Or PD day. Yeah. Is that what they're called? Here they're called PA, I think. I don't know. There's too many of them. And I was a yeah. teacher and I know the importance <laughs> and I know the value. There's got to be a better way than doing it on like random Wednesdays in the middle of like, you know, days when I, everybody has to work. And uh, like I said, I get it. I'm not, I, I'm all for teachers and, and all what they're doing is, is, is God's work. They're doing, pulling in extra weight and all of that stuff. But um, professional days are really difficult to contend with. Maybe I should bring that up on my other podcast on, on educational theory, on lesson plans. We should do a whole episode on professional days. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever thought so about that? About professional about, days in general? Did you have as many professional days when you were in school? I don't think we ever had this. I don't remember this ever existing. And yeah. I went to both private and public schools growing up. I don't remember having this. I don't know. It's anti Sledding we did. It's total but, anti-Semitism, yeah. professional days. It's not good for the Jews. They do, <laughs> they do exist in <laughs> public <laughs> school, but there is aftercare that you have to pay for and then that covers PA days here. We don't have that. We don't have that it's, So it's the same building, but basically there's no pretense that they're learning anything and they're just like possibly watching Baby Shark. Yeah, exactly. It's just, you know, keeping people, kids in a room. Um, yeah, and but that's of, fine, for which we way. are infinitely grateful. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, um, let's, uh, you know, hopefully get through this professional day and all the others and you'll get over your cold and uh, let's get to our main guest right after we hear from our sponsor. Are you in the market for a new watch or a special piece of jewelry? Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring to pop the question? Atelier Lou has all this and more. Eric and the team at Atelier Lou can craft a piece for you, or you can select from some of the exclusive designers that they offer. From a simple bangle to a statement necklace, Atelier Lou can make you or your loved ones sparkle. Located in the heart of Westmount in Montreal or online at atelierlou.com, visit Atelier Lou for your next watch or jewelry purchase. And when you do, make sure to use promo code BON18 for 10% off your next purchase. That's atelierlou.com. Earlier this month, Israeli Justice Minister Yariv Levin introduced a proposal to overhaul the Israeli judicial system. These changes are designed, according to Levin, to rein in an activist court system which has run rampant over Israeli law and to provide the Knesset with greater authority over the High Court Selection Committee, amongst other things. Opponents of the proposal are claiming that these changes threaten the independent nature of the judiciary and put Israel on a direct path to an existential legal crisis. I, I personally would call it a constitutional crisis, but of course, Israel still does not have a constitution. So why should we care about this? Well, depending on who you ask, this will either provide Israel's leadership with the ability to govern properly or spell the very end of Zionism and the idea of Israel as we know it. At an even more basic level, much of Netanyahu's policies and even his personal freedom hang in the balance. The law of return and authority over the chief rabbinate will almost certainly be affected by these proposals, and this will reverberate throughout the Jewish world as well. Our guest today sees several parallels to our own constitutional process and has written about proposed solutions. Brian Schwartz is a lawyer and law professor at the University of Manitoba Law School. He has argued cases before the Supreme Court of Canada and has taught Canadian and Israeli law to students at the Hebrew University in Israel. He is also the father to uh, Maître Michael Schwartz, a brilliant legal mind in his own right and seat neighbor of mine at Shul on Shabbat. But that's neither here nor there. Brian, welcome to Bonjour Chai. Good morning. 
Can you start by um, explaining to uh, our listeners how Israel's legal system works? What this, when we talk about basic law, what this is, uh, does it function as a constitution or not? Um, give us a very brief overview of what's going on here before we get into the weeds. A brief overview is both of us come from the British constitutional tradition. So in both cases, the longer standing tradition was the elected parliament makes decisions and courts are there to interpret and apply the law, but courts cannot take it upon themselves to say this law violates human rights or is otherwise unreasonable. Uh, in Canada, in 1982, we got our constitutional act together, got Canadian control of how we amend our constitution, and we set out a, a number of processes to amend our constitution. Amending our constitution is generally not easy, but we know exactly what the formulas are for doing it. And these formulas are different than ordinary legislation, generally speaking. So if you wanted to amend the Charter of Rights, you'd need the consent, make it oversimplified, of about seven provinces and the federal level of government. So you got your ordinary track for ordinary legislation. You have a special track for constitutional amendments. Uh, why? Because constitutional amendments override ordinary old legislation. They're permanent. They're supreme. So we have a special process for making constitutional amendments. Israel has not yet developed the two distinct tracks. Right now, the Knesset, the elected assembly of Israel, does double duty. It's an ordinary legislation, so fix up the uh, tax on dog licenses. And sometimes it is a constitutional convention and it passes basic laws, which can override ordinary laws. So it's very confusing in Israel from the point of view of an ordinary observer, because you say, well, what is your amending process is different from your ordinary old lawmaking process? And the answer is, well, sometimes the Knesset puts on its amendment hat and it's a constitutional con convention. Sometimes it's just passing ordinary legislation. So those are the essential differences. I can explain that what Israel has done so far with its basic laws, uh, if you'd like. Well, why don't you explain to us um, what um, what these overhauls right, are uh, proposed to be and how they are going to affect uh, what are the major differences between the way things were and the way things are supposed to be now based on these proposals? Well, there's a, a whole package of reforms. Uh, I guess the theme of them as a whole is more power to be elected legislature, more power to the elected government, less power to the courts. That's the theme. The basic idea of the movement is that the courts have gone too far in interpreting and applying basic laws to limit government. Oh, we folks who are against what the high court has done think that they have undemocratically overreached, that they interfere too much with ordinary legislation, and they interfere too much with ordinary politics and ordinary administrative discretion. So we want to seriously cut back on the balance between the courts and the elected legislature and government in Israel. In a nutshell, that's the general idea. There's some cultural and political ideas behind that, but that's in a nutshell what the legal idea is. You, all systems, democratic systems, are supposed to have some balance among the courts, the executive, and the elected assembly, the critics of the status quo say too much power to the courts and they want to give more power to the executive, more power to the legislature at the expense of the court. I'm I'm curious, you know, because uh, I guess I can't help but see the parallels, and I've been seeing these ever since the election, basically, um, between what's going on in Israel and the what happens in Canada in terms of the notwithstanding clause. Um, maybe, uh, Phoebe, are you aware of the notwithstanding clause existing in Canada? Um, do you, do you, sure, I I've seen it mentioned in the news and Phoebe, so forth. Phoebe is, I'm American. is American, but she lives gonna, in Canada. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I'm American, but I live in Canada, and I will soon-ish have to take a Canadian citizenship test, so I better um, brush up on all of this. What's Canada? No, um, what what is the notwithstanding clause for somebody who just arrived from the spaceship from America, like me? So Canada has a charter of rights and freedoms, basically about individual and minority rights. It's one chunk of our constitution. They have lots of other things. They tell you how the courts work. They tell you how the legislature works, how amendments are made. But one chunk is our equivalent of the American Bill of Rights. 
when the charter was established, there was a lot of controversy about, did we really want to switch to the American system where a court can override a legislature using a Bill of Rights, or in our case, a Charter of Rights? So being Canadians, we sought it off. We, we came to a compromise. And the compromise was, yes, we will have a Charter of Rights, and ordinarily the courts can say, this piece of legislation violates the Charter of Rights, so it's invalid. But being Canadians, our compromise was, the legislature can then respond. It can, if it wishes, override most of what the rulings are of the Canadian courts under the Charter of Rights. The mechanism is you pass a new piece of legislation and say, we pass this notwithstanding the I Canadian see. Charter of Rights. And so freedom. is it sort of like a, the Supreme Court declares something un- unconstitutional and a legislature says, never mind, like, never mind that we're going to overrule what you just said? Okay. Yes, for a limited period of time, okay. five years, which you can renew. If you live in Quebec right now, um, you're quite used to the use of the notwithstanding clause because the Quebec Legislative Assembly has used it on some occasions in a wholesale manner and sometimes to protect certain legislation involving the secular nature of, of Quebec mm-hmm. uh, at the expense of any judicial review, any court intervention. To I see. So I see. So I guess the reason why I keep thinking about it is that you know, until recently, the notwithstanding clause was basically only used by Quebec as Quebec's sort of get out of jail free card in that we want to stay part of Canada, but we don't agree with this piece. And so we're going to, you know, throw in this card and say, yep, that's what we're going to, you know, but other provinces have started using it or threatening to use it. And now all of a sudden, um, we're starting to see the dangers of having this type of uh, legislative override over any sort of judicial piece. And I right away say that this is a lesson that Israel should be learning about the nature of legislative overreach over the law is is am I off base here? Is that um, are there lessons to be learned about the mistakes that we've made in Canada that Israel should be looking towards? Um, is there a solution? The uh, notwithstanding clause is used rarely in uh, outside of the province of Quebec. There's a lot of political backlash you will get for using it. Uh, should it exist as all? Are you scared? Well, that's that's a, a political and value judgment. Uh, myself, I'm, I think we should retain the notwithstanding clause. Every so often, the courts do overreach, and every so often, their overreach isn't protecting the little guy against the big guy. Sometimes I think occasionally it overreaches and protects the big guy from the little guy. A recent example would be, and you may disagree, but in a pinch, could an Ontario legislature said, no more strikes, teachers. The, the kids have been disrupted enough. We want the kids back in school. And even though the Supreme Court of Canada said that the, they somehow found in the charter that there were certain collective bargaining rights for public sector unions and the right to go on strike, we will override it. Um, the ordinary conception is courts, unelected people, dispassionate, free from politics that can protect the potentially oppressed from the oppressive majority. But it doesn't always work that way. So different people will disagree with that. I bet you the, the survey of Canadian constitutional law profs, most of them would be against it. Uh, retaining the charter. So who is, sorry, who is the little guy or the big guy in, in that scenario? The And it's and a scenario I know from, I, I encountered, you know, firsthand recently when the schools were closed. Now, the little guys in that case are the school kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, school they are kids little. don't vote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are the yeah. little people. They don't mm-hmm. vote. They don't have, there's no Ontario Association of School Children that can demand that the provincial government negotiate with them. But the teachers are relatively powerful in politics in, in the provinces. We have statutes that protect the right to collective bargain. They have mailing lists. In effect, they can tax their members, so they have money. They can hire lawyers, go to the Supreme Court of Canada with best counsel. Uh, it's not always the case. Think about inmates and prison guards, right? Inmates are very vulnerable people. Prison guards have good unions. Who's the little guy sometimes if you're balancing the rights between the two? So you can imagine some cases it's not... Always the case that the courts got it right. The, the worst atrocity in, in Charter of Rights, Bill of Rights history, of course, was the Dred Scott decision in the United States. Uh, an appalling decision by the Supreme Court of the United States to say that a legislature could not prevent uh, slavery from spreading to another state. Um, it was insane at the time. It has not worn well in history, but it's an example of this time the courts uh, weighing on the side of oppression rather than freedom. So what are you personally worried about if these proposals come through? Well, these proposals are, in my view, the, the initial drafts are w- 
moving the pendulum way too far. So they're, they're not about calibrating the benefit, uh, the, the balance between the legislature and the courts in Israel. In, in my view, they go way too far in terms of minimizing the role of the court. I'm, again, I believe in checks and balances. So I'm suspicious of everybody in the courts. Can go what, are some, what are some potential examples of what might happen in Israel with this? Okay, so you have a, a court saying by a 12 to 3 ruling, uh, we, we continue to say, we the Supreme Court, that it's, un, it's against the, uh, the basic law to continue to exempt some people from army service and not provide some sort of other national service, right? It's not fair to the ordinary Israelis whose kids have to go into the army for two or three years, put themselves at risk, and other people don't have to do anything. Not even not join the army, they may not have to do national service, they may get all kinds of benefits that other people get. That's not fair, and the High Court of Israel has said that's not fair. So uh, the Netanyahu coalition says, no, it's not it's only not fair, it's great, uh, let's pass a law saying, Dati people or ultra Haradim never have to serve in the army, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then a majority of the high court says, you know, that's against the basic law and human dignity. And, it, and they only, uh, a narrow majority says that. That wouldn't count anymore. Now, according to the proposal, you'd have to have a huge majority in the high court to say, to strike that down. And then even if you struck it down, an ordinary majority of the Knesset could overrule that. You don't need two thirds, you don't need 60%. Any ordinary majority can do that. Uh, it makes it way too easy, too hard to have laws invalidated. It makes it way too easy to override it. Is there a room for a principled compromise, a reasonable one? Uh, I proposed one in my article, immodestly. I have some ideas for finding a reasonable middle ground. But what's proposed there, I don't think is balanced and it will hurt Israel's external image as well. Um, it's making Israel look bad. Israel is always beleaguered. It's always subject, in my view, to selective and unfair criticism. One of the things that Israel could say in response is, okay, folks, you, you want to criticize this? Find another liberal democracy in the area. Except now the critics can say, well, you're not quite the liberal democracy you used to be, are you? So I don't think what is proposed fairly accommodates the interests and views of different constituencies in Israel. You want you want unity in Israel. You don't want to think one faction think they've been overborne by a particular faction. You're always looking for a reasonable middle ground among the secular, the religious, the right, the left, uh, the minority communities and the Israeli majority. This is not balanced on its merits and it's making Israel look bad. It would be bad for the economy. It would be bad for the image. Now, unlike some folks, I don't think this is all black and white. I think you could find a much more moderate package of proposals. And some people have said to me, you know, uh, could we just settle down here? Don't try and push this through. Slow down. Let's think hard about the actual substance of these. Some of these might have some merits if refined, if limited. Uh, I'm hoping that will that's what will happen. And I can't tell yet because it seems to be to be good fair. Good. If you think that the Haredim are the ones that are actually behind a lot of these changes, then it is all black and white. Um, I'm making a joke about the uh, Haredi guard. Uh, anyway. Well, I, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's certainly a view. Uh, for example, uh, senior Israeli politicians on the Labour Party said, "Don't negotiate at all." Right? They hold a gun to your head. There's someone doing something really stupid. It's a bad idea to negotiate. Uh, this package, I think, it goes way overboard. Uh, in my view, it would be a good idea to sit down and actually try and arrive at a rational middle ground. And yeah, we may have different views about the blackness and the whiteness. Um, some Haredim do army service. Some Haredim do other forms of national service. Some Haredim are contributing to the state of Israel in their own way, uh, maintaining the tradition, uh, producing a, a next generation that is uh, committed to the Jewish tradition. Um, now, there's different ways you want to balance this. It's not a good idea to have a significant and growing section of society not earning a reasonable living, getting transfer payments, not paying taxes, not doing army service, and not doing a substitute. If you get to that extreme, that's actually a serious problem for Israel. But uh, I guess I have to say, I'm going to sound kind of goody two-shoes here. I'm, I'm sympathetic to almost everybody in Israel. For me, it's uh, I have my own place on the spectrum. I, frankly, I, I guess you could say I'm a Yuri uh, Lapidnik. Uh, so I guess I'm in the 
I'm a centrist, but I think we need to listen to other folks with other points of view and, and try and understand what's bothering them and see if there's actually something there that we can reasonably address and accommodate. With this package, there are some things uh, that could be reasonably done. Uh, for example, the Israeli Supreme Court right now is entirely appointed by non-political bodies. In Canada, a non-political body recommends what the government decides. Does that, that's not an unreasonable thing to say Israel should be like that. But the proposal on the table is not like that. It's way too tilted in favor of um, You know, you mentioned that we both come from a British uh, legal background, Canada and Israel. Um, there's something that I can't help but think about um, that the Jewish nature of law and the uh, not just uh, a p- possibility of dissent, but the uh, welcome, uh, welcoming and acceptance of dissent within the Jewish legal tradition um, is fundamentally part of the Israeli system, um, except for the fact that at the end of the day, the reason why dissent uh, was always part of the Jewish tradition, not the reason why, but one of the uh, features of this is because at the end of the day, we never really had a government to govern. We never had a land to govern. And so it's easy to have dissent because there's no Jewish Pope. And so this position and that legal position, that legal position, they're all fine. And if you have a rabbi that you're associating yourself with, then you follow that custom and that tradition. And I may, may not agree with it, but I don't have to live with you. And that that comes into real, um, you know, opposition with the fact that when you have to govern, you need one law. We don't get to say that you have a law and you have a separate law. And that, you know, that seems to be part of the what's at play here. How much of that do you think actually is in the air of uh, the very Jewish nature of dissent and how that plays into the court system? And uh, wh- how can we possibly come to this middle ground where we allow for this and we allow for this judicial? You know, uh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you that uh, Judaism is uh, one part of the tradition is its openness to not only dissent, very challenging forms of dissent. If you read the Talmud, you will have episodes where it, the, the rabbi of rabbis, one of the most prestigious ones, says something, and the next sentence is, but somebody else disagreed, and the majority went the other way, and turns out that super rabbi was wrong. Uh, I still remember an episode in the Talmud where a rabbi and a and a ordinary farmer disagreed about a point of halacha. Um, the rabbi excommunicated the the poor farm worker, turns out the farmer was right, and the rabbi then did penance by excommunicating himself or putting himself under temporary uh, ostracism. Uh, so, yeah, uh, what is the Talmud? It's a record of debates. What is the Tanakh? The Tanakh includes the prophetic tradition where a prophet is going out and not making himself popular, but defending the rights of the poor and the stranger in our midst. Uh, this has always been part of Jewish tradition. In fact, uh, the liberal tradition in our society, the Enlightenment tradition, the checks and balances, democracy, not believing in a tyrannical king, all of this was very substantially influenced by the Jewish tradition. When the Enlightenment came and and we went towards democracy and tolerance, the great thinkers of the day were very much influenced by the Hebraic tradition. Uh, They were very interested in the Jewish Bible. They were very interested in Hebraism. Some were actually learning Hebrew. The Jewish tradition has had a huge impact on Enlightenment uh, democracy. Um, one of the reasons Israel has lasted this long is it's, it's a paradox, but part of its stability is everybody gets to express a view. Um, and there are checks and balances, and there have been checks and balances. Um, so any kind of authoritarianism uh, is problematic in terms of the Jewish tradition. Uh, anything that is disrespectful of the stranger in your own midst, is disrespectful of Jewish tradition. Uh, Jewish tradition is not about um, tyrannical theocracies. It's not about being indifferent to dissent. So, yeah, I agree with you. And that's a practical value. It's the ability of different people to to have to get along, to tolerate each other, to accept each other is very good for the fabric of Israel. It's very good for Israel's acceptance in the international community. As I was saying, the overboardedness of the current proposal uh, is not only damaging in terms of the fabric of Israeli society, it's, it's damaging in terms of the image, which is not to say, again, that everything in it is wrong or couldn't be worked on. Uh, part of tolerance is saying, well, you know, you're, you're way overboard here, but can we say, let's see what you're saying that actually does make some sense and see if we can meet you at least part of the way. That's the way I would like to see the debate go. Um, 
people are pushing and have their own resentments and those resentments are best dealt with by trying to step back and saying, well, what's really bothering you and what can we do about it? Not by saying, yeah, we're right, you're wrong, you're nuts, you're intolerant, you're bigots, you know, you're fanatics. Uh, unfortunately, there are some of those. There are always some of those in every society and every political system, but not everybody who's pushing for this, these reforms is, is without some reason, some uh, for them. And if we could slow down, Israel could slow down and engage in a, a temperate, reasonable national dialogue and negotiation, I think some good could come of this. Um, but it means that the current government has to stop trying to rush this through. It has to be open to negotiating. It has to be open to finding some kind of reasonable ground. If that doesn't happen, you just get this further cycle of resentment. Right now, the pushing this are resentful. They think a clique within Israel has not listened to them. Uh, if they push this through, the whole bunch of folks in Israel are going to think they weren't listened to. Uh, the idea right now, I think, is for reasonable people to say, slow down. Basic laws are important. They override other laws. They're hard to change. Slow down, everybody. If it's a good idea today, it'll be a good idea tomorrow. We're not talking about 10 years, but slow down. Uh, let's talk about this. Let's see if we can find for a reasonable ground that's good for Israel and good for Israel standing in the world. Uh, do you think, uh, how freaked out do you actually think that we should be about this package of laws, uh, this uh, proposals, and uh, do you think they're going to pass? And uh, what does it bode well or not for the future? Well, does it mean the end of Israeli democracy? No. Um, is it a bad move in terms of the quality of Israeli democracy? Yes. I mean, it doesn't turn Israel into Enver Hoxha here or Albania. Israel will still be a democracy, uh, but it will not be as impressive, uh, as vibrant a democracy as it was now. So also it bothered, it should bother us that any government just elected with a narrow majority um, should think that it's okay just to rush through major reforms without listening to the other folks. That's disturbing. That's not a pattern we want to see. We want to see any government in Israel governing as the state of all the people and, and trying to find a way where people are moving forward more united, not more divided. So on the freakometer, uh, it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of Israeli democracy. I would say it's very concerning. Again, I'm more perhaps optimistic uh, than you are that it is possible to find a reasonable middle ground. But again, that depends on the slow down, let's think about it, let's work together model eventually prevailing and not let's rush this through and disregard the dissent model. Okay. Well, Brian Schwartz, thank you so much for uh, your insights into this. And uh, as it unfolds, maybe we'll uh, see what happens and uh, need to have you back on for further developments. Okay. We look forward to it. I really appreciate your having me here today. As always, we'd love to hear what you thought. What do you think is the future of uh, Israeli democracy vis-a-vis -vis our its judicial system? Let us know uh, by sending us an email at bonjour at the cjn.ca. Fleischman is in Trouble is the name of a novel by Taffy Brodesser Ackner. She has adapted the story for a TV series of the same name, which has been out and can be seen on Disney Plus in Canada. It tells the story of a marriage that has ended and comes at it from the perspective of both parties who fail to see where each other is coming from and the price that is paid as a result. There are some profoundly Jewish moments in it, um, but in a recent interview, the author asserted that she doesn't see this work as a particularly Jewish piece simply because of the setting that it's in. Now, this really got me thinking, and I figured we should open up this discussion again. Again, we are no stranger to discussing um, the role of Jewishness and Judaism in culture. Phoebe, do you have an operating principle when you consider Judaism or Jewishness in your pop culture consumption? Yes, which is that I find it wherever I can. Where I, I just find a Jewish angle on everything. Um, and it's like a part of my brain that doesn't shut off. Sort of like I find sometimes culture wars angles and everything just not to like foment a culture war, but just sort of like as a lens of understanding the world. So I was thinking about this just recently in terms of my um, rewatching of the 1990s Brit com as time goes by starring Judy Dench, where um, there's a character who's mentioned a lot. And then briefly, you briefly meet this person and his name is Cy Lieberman. So, okay. So the nanny is about the nanny named Fran, right? Uh, Fran, mm -hmm. But it starts so Fran Drescher. in a bridal shop in, in fresh flushing. Are you going to sing the song? Her boyfriend. <laughs> I'm extremely <laughs> tempted to, what but I won't. What was she to do? Where was she to go? She mm -hmm. was out on her she was fanny. Out on fanny. <laughs> um, oh my God, it just came back to me. Uh, so She had style. She had flair. She was yeah, there. But like she was 
she was Jewish, but what makes the show Jewish? I never really saw it. I saw it very much as a Jewish character, but I didn't see it as more Jewish oh. than other shows. Um, okay, so the reason it's the, the only Jewish sitcom is because I think it's really the only one that's sort of unapologetically from a Jewish perspective, wherein the sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant characters are other. They are the ones who are strange. Their ways are presented as being curious and you don't really get that, I think, in the same way on any other TV show that comes to mind. Um, Wasn't it that that sitcom, The Goldbergs, that was sort of well, this fine. retro? Like, I'm sure. I, okay, I may have been speaking <laughs> yeah. hyperbolically. I'm okay. sure there are others, but there's just something about compared to like its cohort of, you know, Friends, Seinfeld, all the other shows of that moment, well, where there was something Seinfeld like, yeah, is, they were. Seinfeld's a big question mark right there, like a big sure, monkey wrench. Sure, but, fr- in but your the nanny works. doesn't. The nanny doesn't kind of you know, go in a roundabout way, like where there's, you know, Frank Costanza, who's Italian, you know, and Elaine Benes, who has her Schicks appeal. No, it doesn't do that. It's just like the nanny's extremely Jewish, but the, you know, and, but by the same token, CeCe Babcock is, you know, not only is she considered strange for being, so this is the, um, her kind of, not rival exactly, but her, Mr. Sheffield, the Broadway producer, who's British and strange for being British and not Jewish, has this assistant, Cece Babcock, who's instead of being kind of like the blonde, you know, sought after exotically non-Jewish woman, as might have been the case in a sort of Woody Allen or Philip Roth world, she's like considered repulsive. So it's very interesting because what you're saying is, is that the reason why in your mind, the nanny is the most Jewish of all of these shows is because it places Judaism as the norm and everything else as the outlier. Yeah, it's from a. It's about vantage point. It, it's about saying that. But that's the argument that Taffy is. makes in this article, right? It's in a Jewish Insider. For those of you who want to mm-hmm. check it out, we can put a link to it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. But like the um, the point that she's saying is that just because the milieu is Jewish and that is the um, the nature of where everything is coming from, and that that's the normalization, doesn't necessarily make it a Jewish um, show. The example that she gives, the counter example she gives, is she goes Jonathan Franz and writes all of his novels from a Christian perspective has very Christian characters in his play, in his novels, and yet we don't think of him as a Christian author, right? His novels aren't mm-hmm. Christian novels. That is just the setting of where things are. And she's trying to make a point, I think, about how um, if you want to call something Jewish, uh, she doesn't say this exactly. She doesn't say what makes something, if you want to call something Jewish uh, or a Jewish piece of culture. She just says that that's not enough or that that's not what she sees it sure. as such. Mm-hmm. I personally think that the the distinction to me is is whether something is coming from a Jewish perspective or whether it has Jewish values and Jewish ideas that it's trying to promote. Um, you know, I was watching The Patient. I don't know if you saw The Patient with Steve Carell. No, if it was from more recently than 1998, probably not. <laughs> I was just kidding. But no, I, I haven't. It came out uh, last year and it, it's, a, it's a crazy premise uh, where uh, a psychologist gets kidnapped by one of his patients um, who fears that he is a, who he, he sees himself he knows he's a serial killer and he basically says you're kidnapped and we're going to treat this because I don't want to do this anymore and he locks him in his basement and uh, forces him to under to like give him treatment you know as often as possible in order to prevent you know him from killing again and again um, and I don't want to get more into that but I found it to be profoundly Jewish not just because it had Jewish moments um, but because it was suffused with like a sense of Jewishness and what Judaism meant to the characters and a sense of Jewish values that the character was living and representing. Uh, The fascinating thing about the representation in there is that uh, usually the children are the ones that end up assimilated um, and and then that's where the source of tension is. In this case, the uh, psychologist's wife is the cantor of of the synagogue and the son becomes religious, becomes orthodox, and that that in and of itself becomes the poor, the source of tension and the thinking and of course there's obligatory holocaust references mm-hmm. and everything but i was like oh that that's a very jewish show as a result and i highly recommended it as opposed to fauda which is very israeli and it's just fourth season just launched this week that's why I'm, I'm halfway through i'm thinking about it all the time and i'm like there's a lot of jewish scenes it takes place in israel there's a lot of hebrew um but there's no jewishness necessarily mm-hmm. they're not grappling with you know an idea that they learned in jewish high school that they're like how is this going to affect my relationship uh with chasing this terrorist or something right that, that never sure. shows up there mm-hmm. i mean i think 
I guess this really does, you know, come down to, you know, different understandings of what Jewishness is. And for me, I would say that, um, that, um, I would say Jonathan Franzen has a cultural specificity no more or less than Taffy Brodesser Ackner. I think that these are people, you know, everybody has, I guess I'm, you know, I'm a modern in that way that like, I think everybody has their cultural particularity. And I think that's sort of more widely understood these days. So you wouldn't say that certain authors are just American or just authors, you know, you'd say it's a white man, Christian, whatever, you know. And I think that that, yes, you know, people talk maybe too much about identity or whatever, but I think that that's useful to understand that everybody has specificity and that everybody can all the same tell universal stories that come from their specific cultural perspective. And to me, what was so striking in the Taffy Brodesser Ackner article was that it seemed like she was taking very much like the sort of old timey Philip Roth perspective of I'm not a Jewish writer, I'm an American writer, you know, I'm not an American Jewish writer, I'm an American writer. As if you can't be all, as if everybody can't, you know, have cultural specificity and speak to a wider, not just American, obviously, people read Philip Roth outside of the United States, I've heard. Um, Yes, I I, I think that was just, it seemed interesting to me that, that she was doing that. But then if, like you say, this is more about a different definition of, like, I guess I wonder whether, I mean, I guess we'd have to ask her whether it's that she's trying to go for a different definition of Jewishness and where, wherein it would have to be religious, values-based, something like that. Yeah. Do, do you read Edgar Carrot? Um I'm familiar. I have never mm, actually read his stuff. Okay. Well, have you heard him on This American Life? You, you've read some of his work, no? Yes, I have. I think yes. it's an interesting yes. edge case in that it's very, again, it has some Jewishness in it, but by virtue of it being in Israel, um, it often being set the, in Israel. Um, but I don't see him as a particularly Jewish author um, mm-hmm. in that he is attempting this, like I'm coming from this Jewish background, but I'm just trying to tell these universal stories that happen to have this setting, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's where I think we just might have different understandings of Jewishness because I would say that anybody Jewish with a culturally... Jewish perspective, and that would include Israeli Jews, is, you know, and that's the, and that's what they're writing about, that that's a Jewish perspective. And I think, um, yeah, I think it would just be a different sort of conception of it. I, I, it's, um, what I hate is the ones that are, you know, unapologetically Jewish and are trying to beat you over the head with their Jewish values, right? That's why I, I never liked as a driven leaf, for example, as a novel, yeah, I don't know if you remember that or if you were made. You, you, no, it's such I don't a know. yeah. It's one of those novels that uh, was written by this guy Milton Steinberg, who writes the story of Alicia Benavuya, who is the famous apostate of the Talmud, and he writes it in a novelization, uh, a novel format. And so many uh, high school students are forced to read this, and it's not a particularly Jew. It's not a particularly great novel because it's so Jewish, because it's trying to be a polemic of some kind or another, or trying to get inside the head of who this person is and what. It's difficult about his dilemmas and stuff like that. And uh, I think it's hard to thread that line to make both you and me happy. I love these novels, right, that we're talking about, right? Uh, Gary Steingart would, by your definition, be a very Jewish uh, novel writer, right? I think so many of his novels are very Jewish, even though he doesn't talk about it that much and he tries to move away from that. Um, And yet I I love his novels. I'm not, I'm not, engaging with them though on the Jewish level I kind of like when you see these things I love just like you said you know I love these moments when they pop up in pop culture and you're just dealing with it I have a colleague um, uh, Naftali Cohn who is a professor at Concordia and he actually collects right he tries to come up with a canonical like list of all the pop culture moments that are Jewish um, which is fun to do and you get that good feeling but um, I don't know I, I don't know what it would take to make both of us feel happy Um, with a novel that has both Jewish content and Jewish values without being too hokey. Do you think that Portnoy's Complaint is a Jewish novel? Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think because the, uh, I would say that the guilt that the author feels about his emerging sexuality is a very Jewish um, thing. And uh, and the way in which he grapples with it and his Americanness at the same time, I think Hmm. is... uh, Is it? So now I'm almost wondering, or is it just a kind of man of his era because what so what i've found so interesting with the way philip roth is discussed and i vaguely remember writing about this at one point and i 
Was it for the forward? Was it for something else? I have no idea. But the point is, I have thought about this, that Philip Roth gets brought up a lot these days as like the white male heterosexual, you know, writer. But at the time, he was really understood as telling this very, you know, particular minority communities story, you know, and coming out of this very specific, you know, like that he was different from like a John Updike or somebody because he was Jewish. And that was such well, a big deal. Once you put him up against a uh, Chaim Potok and what makes those two different? Mm-hmm. That's what I would ask you, like what makes Pornoy's Complete different from The Chosen? How does one like different play with those? <laughs> well, yeah, I know. But I'm yeah. saying, but in terms of like The Chosen, nobody doubts that this was this is a jewish book he's a contemporary he's dealing yeah. with americanness but does anybody like that. doubt that portnoy's complaint is a jewish book i feel like uh, taffy brought us rackner <laughs> maybe <laughs> <laughs> for sure yeah um yeah i think that these are you know have you read mordecai richler um canada's um a little bit but not recently Philip Roth. yeah um yeah. i think that there's a lot of profound jewishness sometimes in there but but yeah. then i stop i have to go back and reread and I say maybe it's just milieu maybe it's just situational but does is milieu not enough like i guess that's i don't know for me like if if we define so, like this then i'm goodness knows what not jewish but i i'm pretty sure i'm jewish, you so. you are i'm yeah. not doubting your jewishness yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no but i mean i think it's the, like yeah it's how you understand it from a baseline perspective that's right? what got me thinking about this entire article was like maybe mm-hmm. it's it's something it's a necessary but not sufficient condition well, do you think that what she's saying, and again, I feel a little bit like we need to just ask her, is that um, Fleischman is in trouble? And I should say, I've read the novel. I have not seen the show yet, although I really do want to. Um, do you think she's saying that Fleischman is in trouble is not Jewish because it's so universal and she doesn't want to be sort of pinned down? And she's saying, like, if Jonathan Franzen gets to be a universal or just American novelist, so do I? Or do you think it's that she's saying this thing about religion and values? She doesn't say necessarily values, I, I don't think. I'm trying like, to remember. Do you think she's saying think, that there'd be such a thing? I think she, all she's trying to say is that just because the characters are Jewish doesn't make it a Jewish, quote unquote, work. And there's something... Right. There's, I guess I just wondered th- that got me thinking. saying that anything would be, you know? I, I because think, I think there's... A, yeah. I mean... Yeah, I think she's saying that there think there are that that's what I got out of it was that and mm-hmm. that's where this whole thing is going is that like I think that there yes. are things that would be Jewish but they have to mm-hmm. they have to bring Jewishness right and and mm-hmm. Jewish I, ideas into into mm-hmm. the fore and not just to say that this happens to be around Jewish stuff right Fleischman isn't grappling with. Uh, what his rabbi is saying, the way a serious man, right? She would probably go and say that a serious right. man, the novel, uh, the movie from uh, the Coen brothers, where this guy goes to his rabbi and keeps asking, you know, he, he wants to find meaning in his life and he can't find meaning and he keeps going and looking mm-hmm. to the sources for Jewish stuff, right? I think that that's, that's Jewish, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's, there's something there about that um, that is Jewish. Yeah, I don't know. I think for me, it, where it gets iffy is in, a, I guess, maybe a different spot, which isn't so much about whether the Judaism, the religion plays into something, but more whether there is a spoken Jewishness or not. And that would be where there's a difference for me between like the nanny and the whole Festivus thing in Seinfeld, where, not to bring that up every single time, but um where there's a Jewish subtext, you know, mm-hmm. really, really strong Jewish subtext that you kind of can't miss. But you also, if you've never interacted with Jews and you're just watching Seinfeld, you might miss. Um, whereas with the nanny, like this is just overt. She's talking about being sure. Jewish. She's talking about going to a kibbutz. She's talking about Yossi, her um, first love, who she then sees again later. Um, yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I'm trying to create the... The, always trying to create the counterfactual in my mind, right? Can you can we think of a novel that was maybe written by a Jew that has zero Jewish characters and yet is still a profoundly Jewish novel or other work of art, where the the ideas cool. being presented are so Jewish, um, even though the characters themselves might not be? I feel like I'm in a in a 
grad school exam and completely <laughs> blanking. <laughs> I'm gonna fail. It's no, um, I'm thinking. sure that that exists. I, well, okay, I have. So an thing, I'm sure that that though. exists, yeah. even though I can't think of an example yeah. either. And I'm like, if okay. that's the case, then it's about more than just the milieu. It's about the context. Oh, so the content. Yes, I can think of. I can think of this, but not for Judaism. So, and we're gonna go back into the Britcoms here. Sorry. Um, Waiting for God, a, another 1990s British sitcom very much about sort of Christianity in various ways, even though kind of the the heart of the show is very much this um, definitely atheist, uh, retired photojournalist, this woman, Diana Trent. She's not, she does not believe in God. She has no religion. That's kind of a big part of the show. But like, clearly there's a lot, like it's, the show is very concerned with, Christianity and both Protestantism and Catholicism in different ways. And it's preoccupied with religion, even though it's not, you know, about people being religious on the whole. So I think there must be Jewish examples of this that are just not coming to mind. But um, yeah, I, I certainly think it's possible. Yeah. And I mean, I think what it does really ultimately and with this we can you know wrap this up and you said it already and i uh, i'm not take i'm not saying it differently I'm not mansplaining back to you but i'm just trying to reiterate what th this uh you said it best is that we're really coming from different perspectives and when an orthodox rabbi reads a novel i i guess i'm asking myself is a jewish I have a different, it's a different way way of asking that same question of when you, who is very, very Jewish, right, but comes at it from a different approach. And I think that uh, Taffy is trying to universalize this. Taffy Burdesser Ackner is trying to universalize this. And Philip Roth is trying to universalize that question. Um, but the question itself doesn't make sense um, unless you understand where the person is coming from. And with that, we'll close that one out. But I would love to hear, um, what are your guys' favorite Jewish novels? Uh, how do you consider them Jewish? Uh, what are examples of uh, either style of novel or other work of art, film, TV show, painting? Um, what makes your things Jewish? Please email us, bonjour at the cjn.ca. I would love to hear uh, what your uh, pieces are. And now let's move on to our Nachas of the Week. Phoebe, what's your Nachas this week? Mine is going to be a recipe. It's not a new recipe, and it's just one I make all the time. It's from SeriousEats.com, and Ooh, it's I love homemade Kenji. bagels a la Joe Goldenberg by <laughs> Adam Kuban. So it's um, a little bit of, you know, French, Jewish, something or other there. Um, we have a sesame allergy in my household, so um, we have to pretty much home make a lot of bread, but especially bagels, right? So um, I'm on a sort of infinite quest, sort of endless quest to make the perfect bagels. And this is really a good recipe. And it produces really um, reliably, are they Montreal bagels? Are they New York bagels? Are they Paris bagels? I'm not sure. But you know, I I can Wait, hold on a second. I, I know that you have a deep yeah. abiding uh, love and respect <laughs> for French culture. Paris does not yeah. even begin to be part of Paris the discussion have anything to do with bagels. That's what's so ridiculous about it, but it just happens to be a very reliable recipe. Whether they come out as more New York or Montreal has a lot to do with the shaping, I find, and also just how long you let them rise. So you can kind of adapt these particular bagels into a more of a Montreal direction or more of a New York direction, depending how kind of puffy you let them get. Mm -hmm. And um, they freeze really well. So if you make a ton of them, you can um, put them in the bagel freezer section of your toaster and do that. But you probably won't have many left because they are quite tasty. So um, I highly recommend making huge numbers of bagels at home. It's something to do. I, I don't bake, so I'm going to pass on that one, but I trust you and I <laughs> can't wait to maybe, I don't know, I'll pass it on to one of the kids uh, in my house who do bake and we'll see. But I do love and respect series seats. Um, I, I'm actually going through... Uh, uh, Kenji Lopez Alt's new cookbook called The Walk, where uh, I'm doing a different stir fry a week for the kids to really uh, open up and expand what they have available to them in terms of eating. Because my kids don't eat anything, but that's a different discussion. So um, my nachas this week, am I allowed to uh, do a nachas for something that's not quite readily out yet? It's out in Israel, but it's not had a wide release yet in uh, in the rest of the world. 
Go for it. Okay. Um, I want to give a nachas to a new Israeli TV series called Hanshi. Uh, the IMDb description is a girl from the Jewish community immigrates to Israel and embarks on a wild journey, but the transition from a life with clear rules to a life without any rules at all throws her into a whirlwind of life experiences. It's, uh, she, it's a, Hanshi is a girl from a Jewish Orthodox Brooklyn family. She uses the story of a friend's wedding in Israel as a cover to escape her conservative bubble and fiancé, free to fulfill her forbidden fantasy of sleeping with Israeli soldiers. Her trip triggers a past trauma threatening to ruin her adventures. Um, from the clips that I've seen, it is hysterical. Um, it has Henry Winkler as her as the protagonist's father. Um, so that's deeply uh, fun there. Uh, but most importantly, it stars Elisa Chanowitz, who is my wife's first cousin and who I know from all family events and stuff. Um, she is uh, the writer. She's the showrunner. She is the star. Uh, I highly recommend you go and check it out. It just was on Sundance this week and that's why at the Sundance Festival. And that's why I am shouting it out and saying this is it. It just got a, a big notice um, through that uh, through the Sundance Festival itself. So when it comes out, I highly recommend you go check it out. That is my Nachas for the week. That sounds excellent. Thank you, Phoebe, for uh, being part of the show today and uh, hope to chat again next week. Sounds good. Look forward to it, Avi. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending January 28th, Shabbat Parashat Bo. The show is produced and edited by Zach Kaufman. Our executive producer for CJN Podcasts is Michael Freeman. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at thecjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It's one of the best ways we get new listeners. Listeners. As always, you can email us with comments at bonjour at thecjn.ca. I'm Avi Feingold. And I'm Phoebe Maltz-Bovey.